All right, as everybody's heading back to their seats, I have a question. Have you ever misdiagnosed a problem that you were having? Recently, someone I know had a car that wasn't running well, so they took it to the mechanic, and you know the story. It's probably happened to you before. The mechanic looked over it and diagnosed the situation incorrectly. You actually have to fill your car up with oil when you drive it. No, no, that's not it. that wasn't it. But that misdiagnosis led to a replacement of many working parts that weren't actually broken. It led to spending tons of money that didn't need to be spent, and it led to a long time of waiting in the unknown and a failure to solve the true problem on the vehicle. Similarly, I recently heard a story of a woman who was having some health issues, and she went to the doctor, and the doctor incorrectly diagnosed her to be pregnant. Tragically, by the time the doctor realized that he had misdiagnosed her, the tumor in her body had grown out of control and within months it had killed her. True story. So here's the thing, misdiagnosing problems can be very, very serious. And the apostle Paul realizes it as we're opening in the book of Romans. He is laying out and explaining that the gospel is the answer, the one and true only answer for humanity's greatest problem. So if you're looking at Romans as a whole, we've been into the introduction last week. And as we begin today, chapter 1, uh, verses 18 through 32, Paul is explaining why the gospel is the answer for people who are the most obvious sinners. And you're like, well, that's not me this morning. (laughs) But think like this. Think younger brother, brother, prodigal son. You guys have all heard that story in Luke 15. Or think about the uh, millionaire playboy. In that regard, it's the people that are most obviously sinners. The Gentiles are the nations, in Paul's mind, those that are not Jews. But in chapter 2, verse 1 through 29, which we hope to cover next week, Paul explains why the gospel is not only the answer for people who are the more obvious sinners, but it's also the answer for the people who are the most subtle sinners. Think about the text that never got preached in Luke 15. On the other prodigal son, the older brother, right? Think about him because even though he didn't go off and spend all the father's money, he was equally rebellious of heart and in need, right? Think about the mini van driving soccer mom churchgoer. That's what we're thinking about this morning. So why does Paul spend time in Romans as we begin talking about both categories of sinners? Well, he wants us to know this. We have the same problem. It's not primarily, listen, this is what the world wants to tell you, or this is what people will say. It's primarily a problem of my circumstances or my parents or my background or my upbringing. I haven't been taught correctly. That's primarily the problem. Or if you're a churchy religious person, your primary problem is all those other people who don't have their lives together, right? Isn't that true? You're like, if I can just get rid of all those other people whose lives are messed up or my kids' lives who are messed up or those people who I work with whose lives are messed up, I'd be great. I don't got any problems. It's just them, right? Any amens? No, no. (laughs) But this is what Paul wants to say as we open the book of Romans. Something that's very hard to swallow. Your primary problem is you. David Lyles' primary problem is me. And it's, that's right, Cole, and our sin against a holy God, okay? Our sin against a holy God. Paul doesn't want us to deny our sickness. He wants us to see the severity, and I'm using this correctly, not lightly. He wants us to see the severity of our spiritual condition. We actually have spiritual cancer. And until we recognize that, we'll never cry out in desperation and in faith to Jesus and receive the good news of his gospel for ourselves. It's like Luke 5, 31 through 32 said, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. You say, obviously, Jesus, true, right? But this is what he says. He says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners for repentance. And he was hoping that you would read that and say, I'm sick too. I'm as sick as much as the next guy. I need Jesus just like everybody else. This is crucial because the good news is for both categories of sinners. So if you think, I'm not, 
you know, an obvious sinner. I got my life together. This gospel is for you. And if you're like, hey, my life is in shambles. I mean, I can't stay out of drugs. I can't stay out of alcohol addiction. I can't stay out of broken relationships. This gospel is for you. It's for all of us. The good news is that Jesus died and raised. We opened up the gospel like this in Romans 1. He died and raised for all who would believe, who receive his gracious gift of salvation. That's who this message is for. So before we jump into the middle of Romans 3, you guys know that that's where Paul really begins to unpack the gospel message, this Romans 3 ocean of the gospel. Before we jump into that, I want us to spend a couple of weeks realizing how battered and broken our ship was on the rocks and the shore of our own sin before we see the beauties of the gospel. So by the time we get to the gospel in Romans 3, we'll long for and celebrate the gospel like a suffocating man does when he finally finds oxygen. You ever been under the ocean? Bam, bam, and finally when you're a little kid, you get back up. (laughs) That's that's how we want a gospel. Yes, oxygen! (laughs) Yes, the gospel, right? We want to stare at the pitch black backdrop of our human condition longer than we think is comfortable. Okay, like, let's get on to the good stuff. Come on, I heard the gospel's in there. No, you'll never get how truly awesome the gospel is until you stare at the black backdrop of your condition so that when God brings out the big old gospel diamond, we'll be like, man, it pops. Man, it's amazing. The gospel is truly amazing and beautiful. So the title of my sermon is The Problem, Why We Need the gospel, the problem, why we need the gospel. And I've really only got two points, but I add, added the third one so we wouldn't all go home depressed at the end, okay? So I'll explain that later. Okay, so first point, God's wrath revealed. God's wrath revealed. Okay, so in Romans 1, 17, remember Paul's giving an argument and we're, he's building and there's logical connections, okay? God doesn't just say, hey, take your brain and just toss it out while you read the Bible. No, <laughs> he's inspired a logical message, a word. Romans 1.17, where we ended last week, Paul ends the opening section by explaining that the gospel uniquely displays God's righteousness. And I take this to mean that by faith alone, Sinners are given the gift of Jesus' perfect record of righteousness so that they stand before God justified. And God is faithful and just to do what he promised in saving sinners. But in Romans 1.18, Paul wants to give us a contrast, okay? There's also some bad news. For the unbelieving, they don't get God's grace because they reject his truth, right? Regardless of who they are, they will receive his wrath and anger against their sin. But here's the good news. As one pastor reminded me in a sermon last, uh, last week, well, first, we often think wrongly about God's wrath, okay? So when I say God's wrath, what do you first think of? Tell me, what do you think? Anything? What comes to mind? I say God's wrath, you say what? Anger, you say punishment, okay. Anybody else? Do you think future or present? What do you usually think? What do you think? A mix? Future, Okay. So here's the thing. First of all, some clarification on God's wrath. First, God's wrath isn't like our wrath, okay? You're like, I got a temper, okay? Well, it's nothing like your temper, okay? What do I mean by that? It's not like crazy Uncle Bill who sinfully and arbitrarily loses his temper at family function and then rages out of control on everybody. And so they're like, oh, we better, you know, tiptoe around Uncle Bill and walk on eggshells. No, it's not right. Uncle Bill is the problem in that scenario. But with God, his wrath actually flows. Think about this for a second. Sorry if anybody has an Uncle Bill. God's wrath flows out of his perfect holiness. Think about that for a moment. His perfect justice, his perfect love, okay? God's wrath in that sense is never a negative thing, right? God's wrath in that sense is always good, always appropriate, always warranted, okay? And God judges sin, and when he does, it's always correct. So that, in a, a, a common illustration, if a judge sends a murderer, you know, 
if a, if a murderer comes into a judge, if that judge is a good man, a just judge, he doesn't say to that murderer, hey, no big deal, and then take the murderer out for ice cream, okay? That's not a good judge, right? He rightly judges and sentences the person. So God's wrath is not like our wrath. Second, Romans 1.18 shows us that there is more than one display of God's wrath. When most people think about God's wrath, they only think about the wrath coming in the future at final judgment. It's mentioned like that in Romans 2.5, and we'll hopefully get to that next week. But Paul says there is another kind of wrath, and it's coming, mind blown, right now. He says it in the language, it is being revealed. That is, is actually being revealed in the present. And you say, wait a minute, on who? Or how? Paul says, if you read the the scripture with me, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So God's wrath is coming on the unbelieving who reveal their unbelief in their bad deeds. And Paul uses two words to describe them, these people. First, he says, ungodliness. You see those two words in the verse? Ungodliness is the word in the Greek that points to our vertical sins against God, right? But God's wrath is also coming against those who are unrighteousness, unrighteous. And that is the Greek word that has to do with people who have committed horizontal sins against their fellow man. So both are covered. Your sins against God and your sins against your fellow man. And Paul is gonna show us in verse 18 through 23 that the rotten fruit of our sin against people is actually rooted in our unbelief and idolatry against God. You're like, where does it come from? That's exactly where it comes from. And then in verse 24 through 32, Paul will show us that our sins against God and others are the very reason that we justly deserve his wrath. See, his wrath is a just consequence against our unbelief and our idolatry towards God. And he shows us that in the cause and effects language in verse 24, 26, and 28. I want you to see the pattern, okay? There's a repetition of a phrase, and I want you to look for it in verse 24, 26, and 28. Do you see the repetition? Here we go. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to the, a debased mind. He's making a connection there, okay? So here's the question. What does the present wrath of God look like? Does it look like hellfire and brimstone falling on Sodom and Gomorrah? Does it look like plagues, like in the Egyptian plagues? Does it look like Noah's flood waters? Note, Paul tells us in verse 24, 26, and 28 that the present wrath of God looks like, listen, this is mind-blowing, God giving the sinner up to their sin. I'm going to say it in a slightly different way, but look at that pattern right there. God gave them up. You see it right there? God gave them up. So listen for a second. God's revealed wrath is on display in the unbeliever's life when they say this, from birth till whenever. God says, you don't want me? Fine. I'm gonna finally give you what you wanted. You don't want my truth. You don't want me ruling over you. You want to go your own way. And God says, finally, I'm just gonna let you do what you wanna do. It would be like what happens if a boat was heading over a waterfall and the boat spoke, and that's weird, right? But, okay, I'm trying. The boat says to the captain, I wanna do what I wanna do. I wanna go over the waterfall. And the captain says, okay, you're on your own. And the rapid takes the boat over the waterfall and it shatters into pieces at the bottom, right? Or if the earth says to the sun, forget you, sun, That sounds funny. (laughs) I want to be the center of the universe. I don't need you, son, S-U-N. And then the son says, okay, I'll give you what you wanted. And the son 
says, try surviving on your own. How long is that going to last? Frozen in an instant. The author C.S. Lewis talked about what theologians refer to in this passage as God's passive wrath. In his book, The Problem of Pain, when he says this, listen for a second. The lost person gets the horrible freedom they've always been demanding. Listen to that phrase, the horrible freedom. And if you know the glories of the gospel and the good news, you get that. You're like, hey, to get what you want and to be enslaved to your broken nature and to your sin and live a life in rebellion to God, you don't want that. It's horrible freedom. It's a slavery like none other. So the result is those that say, I don't want you, God. I don't want you, God. I don't want you, God. God gives them over to their sins. And it takes them further away from God, the giver of true light, life, hope, forgiveness, and peace. And it takes them further down in like a sin spiral into brokenness and rebellion against God, which negatively impacts every relationship that they have. That's God's wrath on display. But I'm not just wanting to show you that God's wrath is currently revealed. Paul also wants to show us, my second point, that it's completely deserved. God's wrath is deserved. That's my second point, if you wanna throw that up there. Verse 18, Paul anticipates that when talking about God's wrath, some will object and say what? It's not fair. Channel your inner child, okay? And stomp your feet and say, it's not fair. Don't really do that, okay? Because God's always fair, right? And really all of verse 18 to 32, if you're looking at it, is just a long explanation of why God's wrath and judgment coming upon the world and sinners is fair, Okay? So I'm going to tell you why it's fair in like three or, four, uh, three or four places. First, in verse 18, God's wrath is coming against people who knowingly suppress the truth, and that's why it's fair. Okay, look at verse 18. The picture is not this. Okay, now this is not you, but let's imagine. Mankind was going down the back road at 50 miles an hour, and oops, he was pulled over by the cops because he didn't realize it was a 35-mile-an-hour zone. And that... In that illustration, they were innocent and ignorant of the speed limit truth. Okay, that's not us. That's not it. That's not mankind's condition. Instead, this text teaches us that the idea is that all mankind is going down a 70, or going to back, down a back road 70 in a 25, and they knew it because every single day of their life, they drove that way to work, and they kept on seeing the sign every day as they passed by. They did it intentionally. They just ignored it. Verse 19, Paul says it was plain. Look at the text, and obvious to them. Verse 20, they could perceive it. Verse 21, they knew it. They knew exactly what they were doing. But here's the question, how did mankind know? Paul tells us that God's truth has been on display in every person in two main ways, okay? So the first is verse 19. God's truth has been on display through what? You tell me. Outwardly through... Tell me, creation, what was made? You guys got it? And if you fast forward to the end of our text, the second way it's revealed is inwardly through the what? The word's not there, but the concept's there. Outwardly through creation, we see God's truth. And finally, in verse 32, at the end of our text, it's revealed inwardly through what? Starts with a C. Conscience, great. So to break down the first one, creation, day after day, God has patiently and powerfully revealed himself through creation. When we look up at the beauty of the stars or the sunset, when we see the power of God on display through a summer storm or a tornado, when we see the detail and design in a leaf or in the water cycle or the human body, in all that, God is patiently revealing himself to sinners who don't deserve it. Isn't this amazing? The invisible God, the text says, is telling everyone in a visible way by painting on the canvas of creation. This is what he's saying. He's screaming it. Psalm 19 talks about that. Psalm 119, he's screaming this. I exist and I am greater than you imagine and you are accountable to me. Your entire life is accountable to me. That's what he's screaming through creation. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that they are without, you tell me, excuse. Second, Paul shows us in verse 32 that God reveals his truth through our conscience. That is after giving 
an inexhaustive list of human sins, Paul says this at the end of it. He explains all those sins. He lists them out in detail. There are like 21 of them. And he says this, they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. And yet they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. That nailed the human condition right there. You got that? But Paul isn't saying this. He's gonna get to this later, but he's not right now. Paul isn't saying churchy people have the Bible and they know better. So they're gonna face eternal judgment. That is true. But he's not saying that. He's saying that all people everywhere innately know right and wrong without having someone to tell them because they were born in God's image. They have an internal moral compass. Now, what they wanna do with that compass is up to them. But some people just like, snap it, right? But what they do with the truth of God from creation and from the conscience, often, this is what the Bible says, is they actively stuff it down. You know what I'm saying? That's what happens. This word, suppress the truth, is what happens when you go to the pool and you have a beach ball and you're like, I'm gonna see what happens if I take this thing under the water and try to hold it under the water. Kids, what is gonna happen? You tell me. Poof, poof, poof. It's always going to hit you in the chin. It just always does. Does it come back up? Yeah. And that's what God says. My truth is relentless. Go ahead. Try to stuff it down. It's going to keep on coming back up to the top. So what about those people who have never heard the truth about God and about their sin? Paul saying this, they don't exist. I know that's hard for us to believe, but he says they don't exist. And that's actually very helpful if you're talking to anybody who's lost. I don't care if they're an academic and you're like, man, they are just so brilliant and so smart. You're talking to the, the guy who's never studied a lick in his life or going to school, or he's a tribesman on the other part of the world. It's great to know that God has revealed himself through creation and conscience. Say, so what about the tribes in the remote jungles of Ecuador who have zero contact to the outside world? Well, you mean like the Alka Indians pre-Jim Elliott's visit? Thanks for bringing up that example. <laughs> Years later, after the gospel had come to the Alcas, one tribesman said this, listen, quote, you people in the Western world talk about us like we were brutalizing and killing our neighbors because we didn't know any better. He said, but we did know. We knew there was some kind of divine force. We just didn't know what to call him, but we knew he was there and we knew that he was very displeased by what we were doing. That's crazy. Well, what about the people in our modern world who are just so enlightened, God couldn't even possibly be a reality for them? Listen to what former atheist Aldous Huxley said. If you can get through the big words, let's get through the big words together, okay? He writes, I had, that's not the big word, I had motives for not wanting the world to have meaning. Consequently, I assumed that it had none and was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. For myself, as no doubt for most contemporaries, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation. The liberation we desired was simultaneously liberation from a certain political or economic system and liberation from a certain system of morality. You're like, I have no idea what you just said, David. This is the base, basic point. He explains that he objected to a God of morality because the, that God interfered with him wanting to do what he wanted to do. And in that article, in that text, he says specifically it interfered with his sexual freedom. So here's the thing. The truth is all people have an anti-God bias. You do. You're like, if God exists, he deserves all my worship, all my time, all my love. He deserves my life. I've got to lay it down if he exists. We, we are born with this anti-biased on God, against God. And one pastor I read this week said, real tr truth is too uncomfortable. The truth that we're trying to, the beach ball, you remember? We're trying to push it down and it keeps on coming back up. It's too uncomfortable. It requires too much change. And here's the thing, the reason why we push it down is because true truth, God's truth, truth about God, truth about the gospel, it requires us to trust somebody other than ourselves. And we're just like, I don't want to do that. That's why we desperately need God to move in our lives. I'm telling you, you won't, you won't even get a, a look at the gospel unless God starts moving and working in your lives. We're going to get through this one day. We will. Okay, so instead of pursuing the God who reveals himself to humanity, this is what humanity chooses to do. This, this is all people. We choose to replace him. Okay? So second, God's wrath against sinners 
is fair because we choose to replace them. Verse 21 through 23, read it with me. Paul says that although they knew God, now listen, that is in the creation sense and conscience sense, not in the personal saving sense. Although they knew God, they did not honor God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. What does that mean? Kids, it means we made a bad trade, okay? And I'm not talking Pokemon cards, okay? I saw online where someone ordered beef stir fry from Walmart. And you know how Walmart, you know, prepares your groceries for you if you're calling in, right? And they go and they get the order ready and they bring it out to your car. Well, that's exactly what had happened online, I read. And Walmart was out of beef stir fry. So the employee substituted the beef stir fry for a plastic toilet seat. Insanity, how can you look at the list and it say beef stir fry and you're like, uh, this toilet seat will work, you know? How could you do that? But listen, you're like, that's insanity. And that's what Paul is saying with his argument here. He gets down here and he says, look, you look at God in all of his glory and you say, hey, this other thing's more important and better than him, right? We replace God with something inferior, unworthy, unreliable, and that thing or person or feeling gets the praise, gratitude, and service that only God deserves, right? Paul's language right here is, we could have, this is what we could have, we could have the all-glorious God, the weight of majesty. We could have the immortal God who never dies, who is actually life and in him there is life. We could have the creator who is blessed forever, amen. But instead we exchange him for this. Listen, the lightweight, short-lived man-made. Anything else is like that, lightweight, short-lived man-made. We, you say, well, I'm glad I don't struggle with idolatry like all those other people. But Paul says, all of humanity struggles, verse 23. That is in every culture, in every time period, in every heart, it just might look different. One quote I love this week studying from a pastor is kind of lengthy. He said this, we must worship something. That's what this text is saying. If it's not God, a vacuum is created and then we'll insert whatever else is not God into that vacuum, right? He says, we were created to worship the creator. So if we reject him, we will just worship something else. He says, we are a purposed people. We have to live for something. There has to be something which captures our imagination and our allegiance, which is the resting place of our deepest hopes and which we look to calm our deepest fears. Whatever that is, we worship it and we serve it. I mean, we give our lives for it. It becomes our bottom line the things we functionally cannot live without, defining and validating everything we do. And in India, we've been to India, it might look like, the idol might look like a block of wood or a metal statue, but in America, we're just as idolatrous, right? And in church, are we not just as idolatrous? Do we not need the gospel? We, we do. We worship our appearance. We worship our kids liking us. We worship our sporting teams and sport events. I mean, really, if you think about what's gonna happen at the Super Bowl, we can love God's good world and his creation, his gifts rightly, or we can idolize it, right? And people who you never would think would get up and clap or just raise their voice in church, they'd be like, yes, yes, the 49ers were amazing. Their, their chest is painted, right? We worship our rightness. We worship our productivity. We can make idols out of our intellect, our good grades, our cell phones, entertainment, social media, our good health. And I can go on and on and on and on. And here's the thing, we need to repent. We've made a bad trade, right? The question is not, will we worship? The question is what we will worship. What has our hearts will have our affections and therefore will have our lives. And I'm just telling you, I'm a man in desperate need of the gospel. I am. I've struggled this week with false worship. I have, I'm not proud of it. 
And I've had to repent again and again before God. It's looked like overeating for me. You're like, he's a little guy. But you know what? Little guys can love food too much, right? And it's looked like needing certainty in my life, like God has to check all the boxes and let me know what he's doing, and then I'll walk by faith. <laughs> That's not walking by faith, right? It's looked like caring too much about what other people think of me. It's looked like wanting to be in control of my own outcomes in my life. Anybody want to be in control of things and people? It's looked like thinking people need to bring, you know, it looks, it's looked like thinking that nothing good can happen unless I'm in the center of it, <laughs> you know? We really need God, don't we? We desperately need him. Third, God's wrath against sinners is fair, not just because we replace them, but because we sin against God and, other, and others in many ways, in many forms. Look at verse 24 through 32. Paul is showing us that unbelief and idolatry can reveal itself in many ways. In verse 24 for Paul, it looks like the sin of impurity and that word actually carries a sexual connotation here, right? The idea seems to be people want things like power, control, control, enjoyment. So what they do is they replace God and pursue things that are outside of his design. They pursue things like adultery, premarital sex, molestation, prostitution, pornography, just to name a few. And in that moment, they abandon God and they abandon the good gift of sex within the confines of monogamous heterosexual marriage. But it doesn't just take that shape. In verse 26, Paul says that idolatry shows itself in homosexuality. You see that in verse 26 through 27? Either men sexually desiring or being physical with other men or women sexually desiring and being physical with other women. And Paul's arguing that homosexual desires are dishonorably sinful and that all homosexual relationships and acts are sinful because they are contrary to nature. You're like, what does that mean? It means it's a violation of the nature and the anatomy that God gave us at birth. It's a rejection of God's good design and purposes for the gender. You remember Genesis 1 through 2? God made men for women sexually and women for men sexually. And the idea with the language of verse 27 is this, there shouldn't ever be a gay pride march because Paul is saying in verse 27 that from God's perspective, homosexuality is shameful, right? It's a total flip of what our culture is doing. But I'm not gonna stop there because I'm gonna preach what Paul is preaching. Look at verse 29 through 31. He's arguing, he's laying out specific forms of how idolatry may manifest itself in our culture or in our lives. And he's not gonna just pick and choose. Idolatry manifests itself, verse 29 through 31, in greed. Does that hit anybody close to home? Arguing, dishonesty, disobeying our parents. Listen, being uncompassionate to other people. Why did I pick those five examples of sin in a list of 21? Why did I do that? Because in the flow of, of Paul's argument, he's saying that all these sins, the sexual sins he mentioned in the section before, including homosexuality and the multitude of other sins that we might consider insignificant or in some ways acceptable, if we're honest, He's saying all these sins make a person guilty before a holy God and deserving of divine judgment. That's what verse 32 is talking about. All of them. I mean, we were all on equal footing before God. None of us can say I'm better than that other person. No one can say, I don't need eternal life. No one can say, hey, I don't have to worry about God's holiness and justice. No, we all have to say that we all stand in need of God's forgiveness of God's redemption, of God's saving power. None of us can look down our nose at anybody else and nobody can look and say, hey, God helped them, but he can't help me. None of us can say that, right? Paul shows, and, it, and the, the spiral's going down and down and down. You're like, I'm getting super depressed. I am too, okay? But I'm not done. Paul shows us God's wrath is deserved because sin affects every part of our lives. Look at verse 24 and 26. He says it affects our desires, he says it shows itself in the lust of our hearts and our dishonorable passions. He says our sin that we're born into affects our bodies and our actions. Verse 24, Paul says that what happens is we dishonor our bodies. 
And he says in verse 21 and 28, it affects our mind. He says, our minds are debased. This is the doctrine of depravity, okay? But here's the clarification. This doesn't mean that every person you meet is as bad as they could ever be, all right? But it does mean that every aspect of their being is tainted by sin and broken and rebellious from the womb. That's what that means. And God's wrath is also deserved because it has affected and wrecked our relationship with God. The list lists out. And in that list in verse 29, it says there are haters of God. And you're like, I'm not a hater of God. The Bible says you're born with the bent to say, God, I don't want your truth. I want to suppress it down. You tell me what that makes you with God. It makes you a religious hater of God. It makes you a wild, immoral hater of God, but it makes you a hater of God. And God's wrath is deserved because our sin has affected and wrecked every relationship that we have. Think about how sin domino effects into every area of our life. Verse 29 to 32, society in general is broken apart. We covet over social media, so we hate our neighbor. We argue at work, so we don't love our neighbor. We want evil in the, we invent evil in the school locker room, so we don't love our neighbor correctly. We gossip at church and over the phone so we don't love our neighbor correctly. And our sins also break our family dynamics apart. Parents are heartless and without compassion towards their kids. And the text says that children disobey their parents. Are we needy? We're needy people. And finally, God's wrath is deserved because for the non-Christian, sin is not just what you do, it's who you are. Isn't that sad? For the non-Christian, sin is your truest identity. Look at verse 29 through 30. Look at the language Paul uses to describe the lost condition of every human. They are, what's the text say? Filled with all manner of unrighteousness. They are full of envy, murder, and strife. They, look at that text, are gossips. You guys see that? They are gossips. Paul is saying something that nobody wants to admit. Humans are not just pretty good people who make mistakes every now and then. They're sinners. We don't just do a few bad things. Our hearts, minds, and lives are filled and immersed with all kinds of sins. We, we are a sin factor. We mass produce sin. And if you were describing the human condition as a cup, you wouldn't say, oh, it has a few little drops of sin at the bottom of the glass. We would say, no, our glass is full and overflowing, splashing into other people's lives and destroying them and destroying God's image. And that would be us too, apart from Jesus Christ. That would be us too, apart from Jesus Christ. And there's the crazy thing. God's wrath is deserved because our rebellion against God is willful, but our rebellion is also loveless. Think about this as I end verse 32 and wrap up on the human condition. If our consciences are like a a fire detector or smoke detector, we know that we're in a burning building of our own making and design. And what we deserve is God's wrath in the present and for all of eternity. And this is what is warped about the human condition apart from Jesus. We don't love anybody else except for ourselves. And we don't love ourselves enough to believe the good news, right? And instead what we do is we invite other people into the burning building. You know what I'm saying? We support sin. We encourage sin. We Instagram sin. We celebrate sin. We institutionalize sin. We legalize sin, maybe in part because it makes us feel a little bit better about the evil that we've chosen. But because we know the building is on fire and going down, it reveals our lack of love for others. One commentator said it like this, we aren't just bent on damning ourselves, but we congratulate others. And in doing the and doing those things that we know will result in their damnation too. We need Jesus, do we not? We say things that are crazy and do things that are crazy, but it's not just homosexual activity. We tell others, hey, cheat, because don't you need a good grade? Or we advise someone, be physical with your boyfriend, because don't you really just love them? We tell people, don't obey your parents, because your parents don't understand you. Or we excuse our gossip because we say, we're just concerned Or we tell somebody they should leave their spouse because they're not really appreciated like they deserve. Or we say this advice, I wouldn't forgive them either if I was you, right? The human condition is saying, come on. I know the the building's burning, but come on in. It feels great in here, right? Instead, we should be turning people away 
from the building and turning them to the truth of God. So what do we need? Why does everyone, what does everyone in the world need? What are we desperate for? What does this text show us we need? Well, we're, we're gonna wait two weeks from now and I'll tell you then, okay? <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> we need Jesus. Does anybody else feel like overwhelmed right now with the state and condition of you? You're supposed to. You thirsty for a drink from the living water. You thirsty for God's love and forgiveness that we don't deserve. You're supposed to feel like that. And here's the thing. We need God, the good news of Jesus Christ. Knowledge of God through the conscience or creation is inadequate to save a person. Only the message of Christ's death and resurrection and rescue for sinners can save. I love how one author put it. He says this to tie the text together. In, in the beauty of the world, we see God's existence. In the brokenness of the world, we see God's justice. But it's only in the gospel that we can see and experience God's mercy. The craziness of the good news, and if, if you're still alive and you're breathing, you aren't beyond God's grace regardless of what you've done. He's saying to those who previously he gave up to their sins. In this text, he's showing us through, as we get to Romans 3, that it's not an irreversible condition. He's saying, I previously gave you up to your sins, but in my mercy, I gave myself up for your sins, right? He's saying, surrender to me by faith. Don't say I need to be in control and it's about me. Give that control over to Christ. And in the moment that you believe, you can find forgiveness of all your sins. The good news about the gospel is that the son's record of righteousness comes to you not because you earn it or you deserve it or you could ever attain it for yourself, but it comes to you as a gift of God's love, a gift that we don't deserve. And in that moment, God, if you believe his gospel, he will set you free from the power of sin and he will give you new life in the spirit so that you could see and behold his supremacy that you love his beauty, you love his glory, you see the immeasurable worth of who he is and you can worship and serve him from genuine love, gratitude and sincerity of heart. Now that's freedom, right? You say, I just love my job, but inside you're so enslaved to performance and you're enslaved to what you, you, know, you can gain from that. And God says, look, that's idolatry and you're enslaved. I've come to set you free in me, right? God can do it. God can make you a new creation and able, enable you to renew your mind that was much, once depraved and darkened and, and evil. He can allow you to remove, renew your mind by his truth, like Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, so that you can be com progressively conformed into the image of his son, so that you can repent of idols and you can grow in grace and we can see God's love and power and display in our lives. And this is really cool too. When we believe the gospel, he gives us a new identity. Think about that with the, the ending part of the text that we're in. Romans 1, we talked about this last week, talks about this. We are no longer referred to as full of sin and identified ultimately by our sin if you're in Christ. We find our identity ultimately in Christ. And Romans 1, 7 says this, this. We are now all those who are loved by God and called to be saints. That's our new identity. You're loved by God and you've been set apart, sanctified for his purposes. We aren't heading for judgment anymore, not now. We stand in grace now, Romans 5. And in judgment, all of our judgment has been swallowed up by Christ. So we will eternally dwell in God's love and goodness. See, the bad news tells us that we stand guilty and needy before God, but the gospel tells us that no one is beyond the grace of the gospel. Jesus gets the judgment that we deserved and God's holy justice is satisfied. And all those who believe get the riches and blessing that only Christ deserved. And we get it lavished upon us. We get to know him and get the privilege to live for him and make him known. So a few application and then we're gonna sing. If you aren't a Christian, will you stop suppressing the truth of God and replacing him with the idols that you have? And would you repent and believe and be saved? But if you're a Christian, I want you to do similarly, right? Here's my question. Is there any truth of God you are currently suppressing because it's not convenient? 
or the culture's telling you something else? Is there any idol, little I idol that has replaced God in your heart and your affections and that you think really is more important? My question is, what would it look like to embrace God's truth and lean into your Savior, Jesus, and in your Savior, Jesus, instead of worshiping your own idol? Christian, is there any way you are approving or inviting others into sin? Well, what is it? Is there any way that you are living like you are that sin or you are enslaved to that sin instead of living out of a gospel reality that your identity is now a freed, beloved saint? Christian, do you see that the pathway out of idolatry is worshiping God more fully and deeply because of the the gospel? And do you realize this from your text, this text, do you realize what you were saved saved from, right? Do you realize what God did to save you? And if you don't, can we meditate on that today and this morning so that our worship would be more full and more celebratory than ever? And finally, Does knowing you have the only answer for people's greatest problem make you eager to share this good news of the gospel? And I hope that it will. Not just non-believers, but all people, even Christians. Let's pray together and then we'll sing. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you for the blessing of Romans 1. Lord, just to show us the human condition so that we might rightly see the cure. Lord, your your remedy in and through the gospel. Lord, we thank you that you would die for sinners. We thank you that you would love sinners. We thank you that you would forgive sinners. We thank you, Jesus, that you would be our righteousness, our record of righteousness before the Father. We thank you that you would transform us and come live within us and set us free from the control of sin so that we could live rightly in your world and love for you and love for others. We pray that you do that more and more in our lives and we would see your gospel on display, and we take it to others in need. We ask this in Christ's name, amen.